Welcome back everyone to our next installment of Interview with an Expert. Today we are talking with Nika Gwechi. She is the formal, former lead of Recovery Rising here on Arizona State University. And she is also conducting her own research and defending her dissertation today. Congratulations on um, recovery uh, issues on college campuses, which she'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. So, Nika, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, you're welcome. So just to get started, can you talk to us a little bit about collegiate recovery programs on colleges nationwide, potentially, and on ASU specifically? Yeah, sure. So uh, collegiate recovery programs um, have been around since the late um, 1970s, early 1980s. And they were um, specifically started as institutionally sanctioned programs to help support students in recovery. And so what a lot of these programs looked like um, in the earlier days is that you would have students who are in recovery live within a residence hall or within a house okay. on campus. And so they would get their academic support, they would get their social support, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, Narcotics Anonymous meetings, all of that would be within this residential model. Mm -hmm. And so all of the studies have been really done on this residential model okay. about students in recovery. So because ASU is enormous, we have 100,000 students, right? A model that only looks at um, residence halls for students in recovery wouldn't work for us. So when we were charged with starting our own recovery community called Recovery Rising, um, we had a great opportunity and responsibility to our 100,000 students to really shift away from just looking at this residential model. Because what happens when students in recovery leave their residence hall? What happens when they interact in the larger environment? So they don't feel socially supported. The research shows that they go to class and then they go home because they don't feel welcome in a college environment. So we had an opportunity to create a model that encourages awareness and training of the recovery lifestyle here at ASU. Okay, so how has collegiate recovery uh, on college campuses kind of changed over time? Yeah, so initially it started out very small, and now that there's more national attention to uh, prevention and recovery support services, more universities are thinking about starting recovery programs. So because all universities have their own culture and their own systems, what that looks like, even across Arizona, mm -hmm. is completely different. In 2015, each public land-grant university in Arizona NAU, U of A, and ASU received grants from the governor's office to start their own collegiate recovery programs. And what that looks like on every campus is completely different. Okay. At U of A, it's run out of the counseling center. Um, some of them just have student organizations. So it really depends on, um, on the, the culture of the college campus, what that looks like. So do we here at ASU have recovery housing? We have, um, so all residence halls in ASU are expected to maintain sobriety, right? Um, abstinence within that residence hall. However, specifically for students who are in recovery from substance use, we have a place right off of ASU called Treehouse Learning Community. And um, that is a special um, residence hall, a house that is run separately, but with uh, collaboration with ASU. So we have a memo of understanding with Treehouse that if students in recovery need a place to stay outside of the residence halls, they have a space maybe a mile away on Mill Avenue to live. And there they're provided academic support and, um, and housing. Okay. Recovery Rising. Yes. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? Yeah, so Recovery Rising is, um, is a program that was started as a result of this governor's grant a couple of years ago. Um, and for my own research, what I did is that I really wanted to understand what students in recovery needed from us. There was a newly developed student organization called Students for Recovery, and so I interviewed some of them and I said, what can we do as an institution to make you feel supported? And a lot of them said that 
they want um, a different experience than their perception of what the college, college experience should be. So they wanted a safe space on campus. They wanted to know um, about one another. And they also wanted to know, they also wanted other people to know what it means to be in recovery. So if they go to a professor or a staff member and they say, I'm in recovery and I need support, not only will that professor or staff member know what that means, but they'll also know how to provide those resources for them. So Recovery Rising really took into account what the students said and developed a program that provides training uh, for anybody who is interested, um, faculty, staff, community members, other student organizations, about what it means to be in recovery, how to use supportive language, um, how to listen empathetically, what all of the resources are that are available, and also for students in recovery to just to, to raise that awareness that they are here and that there is this group of people that is not only not drinking or engaging in substance use, but actively living that recovery lifestyle. So at ASU, that's what Recovery Rising looks like. OK, and about what percentage of students would you say are in recovery here at ASU? So every year, we do a, a nationwide survey that is also done locally here at ASU. It's called the American College Health Association National College Health Assessment. And from that survey, we were able to determine that those with a history of addiction or recovery is at about 4% at ASU. So 4% out of 100,000 is 4,000 people, which isn't minuscule. Right. Um, so there are people that need the support services, but even more than needing the support services, there needs to be awareness that this is possible in college life. How well educated do you think uh, faculty are in supporting the students here at ASU? I mean, I feel, I feel pretty confident in my support level, but I've been involved with Recovery Rising, and I teach a substance abuse class, but right. how, like, more, the more general faculty population, how, like, how well do you think we do at giving that support that students need? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, and I think that more research is needed on that because I don't have any statistics. Okay. Um, I would say that there is a select group of professors uh, staff and faculty who are really invested in Recovery Rising, whether it's through working with them peripherally or on their advisory board, um, and they help spread that message. So I don't really know. I know that one of my um, management interns conducted a study with, a very small study, at Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College where she asked faculty members what they know about recovery and whether they know about Recovery Rising, and all 10 of them did not did not wow. know, right? Wow. So that's only 10 people, but it points to a larger awareness issue that we could work on. Okay. And so speaking of awareness, uh, for the students in my class and for students in general, um, what can they do to help support their fellow students in recovery? How can they best help them? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of ways to support somebody in recovery. Um, one of them is, of course, knowing all of the resources, counseling, health services, knowing that, for example, uh, disability resource services can provide uh, compassionate withdrawal, for example, if a student needs that um, to help deal with their recovery. But also, it's through one-on-one -on -one peer support. How do we ask questions that are empathetic rather than accusatory? So a question like, what happened, instead of why did that happen, really directs the answer towards um, kind of a more event-based approach rather than an individual responsibility or guilt. So what happened, instead of why did that happen, um, you know, tell me about what makes recovery difficult for you, tell me about what makes life better as a result of your recovery. Mm -hmm. So using that informed language and also noticing triggers. So depending on what the substance is, there might be different triggers. 
Um, for one person, it might be um, being afraid of getting uh, a flu shot at the doctor's office. For another person, a trigger might be opening a can of soda. So, or for another, it might be shaking a bottle of pills. So y you don't really know, but it's just this awareness of this might be something that is, that is triggering and harmful for this other person. Is there any training that students can go through or um, any, um, oh, I guess, training that they can do to be more, um, to, to get that language that they need or to, to learn the, the correct wording? Yeah, definitely. So Recovery Rising provides a training that anybody could take for free. Um, you could sign up for it through your class or your student organization or just come and talk to somebody. It's called Recovery 101 and it's about an hour-long presentation that talks about all of these topics. Now for students like mine that are online, do you have anything that's online for them to be able to, to look at? Yeah, there are, if you go to the Recovery Rising website, which is through the Live Well at ASU website, um, there are a couple of videos and statistics. Um, the most impactful video, I would say, is the one where students in recovery actually share their stories on camera about what it means to them to, to be in recovery. It's a relatively short video, three or four minutes, but it's really, um, it really says a lot. And I think that students even online could learn a lot from that. Great. So I wanted to just kind of end up talking a little bit about your research. And so I know you, you talked a little bit about it at the, at the beginning of the interview, but uh, you're defending your dissertation today. What were some of the major results? Yes, in three um, hours. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. To do this. Um, I'm sure you must be a little bit stressed. But so, what were some of the main results, or what were some of the surprises that you that you found, or what didn't you find that you thought you would? Or so again, what were some of the highlights? Yeah. So I took the um, I took a group of already established peer educators called the Well Devil Ambassadors. This is a group of students who, undergraduate students, who live and work within the residence halls. So they already have training and they already view themselves as role models for the student community. So I uh, took this group of students and did the Recovery 101 training with them. And then I um, had a group of them for a semester and I did more intensive training with them. So we really looked at how does this training influence their knowledge and attitudes and beliefs and their behaviors and self-efficacy towards working with students in recovery. Okay. And what I found is that the most relevant and the thing that all of these Well Devil Ambassadors said was the most impactful for them is hearing other stories, is hearing perspectives of their peers in recovery. A lot of them started with either a neutral or a negative perception about people in recovery. So either they didn't really think too much about it or they had a bad experience with a family member or a significant other. And so they thought that this is this person's fault, they're making bad decisions, and it's really their problem. But after the training, they learned that there are so many social and environmental and genetic factors that go into whether one person um, considers themselves an alcoholic or an addict and another person is able to stop. So I think that hearing those stories was, was the most impactful thing out of everything. And they said that through working directly with students in recovery and, and listening to them and hearing their perspectives, they gained more confidence and greater self-efficacy as a result. And now they're, they feel prepared. You know, they feel prepared to uh, better support, better listen, be a confidant, be a role model to their peers in recovery, should they need to be, even though they themselves are not in recovery. Right. So are there plans to potentially replicate that experience for others? Yeah, it would be great to do so. Um, I think that everybody should take the Recovery 101 training. Um, and a lot of people have. Recovery Rising does this training quite often throughout the campus and throughout the community. Um, it's just that 
I've collected extensive <laughs> research on it. Um, and it would be nice to collect that research in other populations like faculty. That's a great idea. We mm -hmm. should collaborate. Yes. That would be great. Let's do it. Okay. Perfect. You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, well, good luck to you today. Thank you. And thanks again Thank for you. coming down on of such course. A, a busy day. Thank you. And that does it again for another episode of Interview with an Expert. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again next time.